Okay, chapter one beginnings. Uh, but before we get right into the chapter, let me take just a minute or so here. Remember what we need to do is we need to be in modules, right? Everything is gonna progress through modules. So y'all have, the vast majority of you anyway, have done the introductory module. You've done the interact introductory response. Besides the, you know, that, but that one is the shortest one you'll do. And, uh, and one of the things that it does is just you know, make sure you can upload. Run into this every semester, and vast majority of you can upload, no problem. So then what we need to do is just get our first response in, you know, make the words, try to, try to stay on topic. We're going we're gonna to hone our skills later. I did add this. You know, click if you're still having problems getting into Cengage. Look at this, this is different than the, uh, the video I had posted before. Uh, most of you are in Cengage. We've got a few people still with problems, and I think several people it doesn't look like you, uh, you've attempted yet. So definitely click this. It's, it's going to start happening very fast after we get rolling. I'm about to cover Chapter 1 Beginnings, but remember what we're, we're leading to is... Uh, by the time you get this anyway, everybody will have the, your reading questions, excuse me. Uh, you'll get those uploaded. Uh, in this screen test, we usually appear after the, the reading questions are uploaded. We've got to get through the hiccups first, though. So I think just by way of getting through the hiccups, I'm going to try to keep this one short. I'm going to post an older screencast that I did with the previous book. If I'm referencing the book, don't worry about that. I want to get to the symbolic thinking and this sort of uh, Neolithic culture and right? agriculture changed the world and then a kind of a special emphasis on Egypt at the end that, that most students seem concerned with. That should let you do this response dealing with, it, it's really wide open, it doesn't sound like it, but once you understand what symbolic thinking is, you can write about virtually anything in the chapter if you just figure out a way to tie it in. Okay, so I'm going to go to, this is what should happen for you all as soon as I click on Chapter 1 Beginnings. Begins in a new window. Should come, everything should come right up from Canvas. You should not have to go outside of Canvas. Remember to, to turn off your pop-up blocker. Or then this magic won't happen. Uh, right here. So I'm going to, I was going through highlighting I'm going to go, we already covered a, a few pages from the previous screencast, and I think that's going to put us right about to this Akkadian culture. And do realize that for all these, it, it, there's so much in this course that a lot of times when I say things, I'm, I'm skating on real thin ice. A lot of this, when you look at it in greater detail, it'll break down. I'm making broad generalizations. So you see here, uh, y'all have already gone through this. We ha I have other images to draw on. I'd pull up, make this a lot longer than I'm going to make this one. But the other screencast is, I, I believe, a half hour. So I don't want to burden you too much here too early. But what I want to uh, cover one thing before we just jump right into this one is for symbolic thought. And I just want you to, to follow the uh, cursor here, right? A lot of you think that your, your dogs or other pets, that they, that, that they understand language, one type of symbolic thinking. So when you get to this next screencast here, I, I was talking about these vertical lines, but what I was talking about in the class that preceded it is, that's all, a, you know, chimpanzee, dog, so on, that's all they pretty much know. They can make one-to-one -one relations. Right, um, uh, orangutan, chimpanzee, something like that can click on just about any button that uh, that they've been tested on, and they can get you know a banana or other piece of fruit or whatever it is. All these things are concrete nouns; they're one-to-one -one relationships. But if you tell the monkey, or you tell your dog, right? If you know, you know, go get God. Well, all the sudden, the, the dog's just going to look at you. That doesn't make any sense. And so this is what we mean by symbolic thinking, right? So in symbolic thinking, there's not necessarily that one-to-one -one relationship 
between what I say in, in an actual thing, and it's in this case uh, an abstract noun, right? Uh, describe the nature of evil. Well, goodness, right? So I've switched. There's not an actual thing. It's purely symbolic. That's everything in this chapter. That's this mask we're looking at right here. Right? Uh, and I'm saying animals can't do this. There is some data out that, that suggests uh, how about pack animals. Like, you know, the way wolves communicate is incredibly sophisticated. Uh, there's a, a smaller piece, uh, species of chimpanzees called bonobos. Seems like they may have a lower threshold of symbolic thinking than we're able to do, but I'm mean, just go with uh, the mainstream for right now on that. Okay, so anything that's really created, language, art, music, anything that's representational, you know, for us technology, right, has to, it's the product of symbolic thinking. I don't have time to get into it right now, but you may, I mean, just it's, it's, incredibly powerful in that in in this in society and it it tends to work uh probably most obviously in technology right that thing in your pocket right your cell phone uh, nobody has to go back and and redesign a uh, transistor right discover electricity all that because it's all now recorded all the previous advance in symbolic thought you just got to carry it to the next level okay so I'm just real quickly gonna jump through what I've highlighted here. Uh, any law codes right, are very useful as people as, as started moving from tribes in the Paleolithic period to uh, into the Neolithic, which we're well into now with the, the Hammurabi code, uh, where farming takes over. People settle down. I'm gonna talk a lot about this in the, in the second screencast I'm gonna post for this assignment. Changes the farming, changes the world, right? Well, as people settle down, it's usually one person ends up ruling or a group of people, but usually one, there's, there are way too many people under them. Moses runs into this with the, the children of Israel and Egypt, so he appoints people, right? Judges to, uh, dele you know, delegates the rule of law to judges. Well, what's better than delegating to the, to the judges? Just writing it down efficiency. Writing a standard down aids uniform justice and helps distribute it equally across a larger group of people. This is the beginning of bureaucracy that people say they hate, uh, but really they kind of like having arrest. When people get used to a, a lot of the benefits of bureaucracy and government and so forth, uh, that they take it for granted and then honestly believe that they hate it when you know, as everybody knows that uh, crotchety old man down the street who says he hates government and all this, but you know, you better not, you better fix the pothole in front of his house and by God, you better not you know, not even consider taking his medic, Medicare away, right? All, all that sort of stuff. People are, you know, full of contradictions. Okay, uh, thanks, so just shelve that idea from now. You got the Assyrians, Persians, ancient Egypt. Everybody likes talking about ancient Egypt. All right, this is the guy who actually uh, coined the, the idea of period. Some people go with this, some people don't. Egypt was around a long, long time, as you can see. There were longer periods of instability in Egypt when different people, like say the Assyrians or, or somebody, was in ruling Egypt then and eventually got ran out. Then we've been around as a country you know, in America. So long, long history, but it's tended to uh, stay unified inconsistent, base, basically culturally. A lot of it, things change over 3,000 years, but the, the, this desire for unity, what happens after that? They were just obsessed with it. So Egyptian religion. Uh, belief in the afterlife is the, is the most important thing, but while we're here, I may, I may revisit this at some point. It's a little bit too rich to, to pass up in the spring, but a lot of the names that are familiar with you, uh, to you have started in Egypt. So if I just start moving some consonants and vowels around, so it's like Hathor, 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 Esther, Esther from the Bible, Esther, Esther, now move the vowel. Easter, right? I mean, have you ever really wondered why on earth do you have, you, with uh, the resurrection of, of, of Christ, with Christ, right? The resurrection of Jesus. What, why on earth is that accompanied with the bunny 
and an Easter egg hunt. Well, that, that goes back to Hathor. A lot of the stuff got smashed together way on down the road. That was Easter eggs. Or, uh, the Egyptians had, they dyed their Easter eggs uh, red, right? It was, a, it was a fertility festival in the spring. Um, bunny rabbit, fertility, right? Symbol of fertility. So it just, it's kind of, a lot of things are going to get smashed together that we're going to talk about later. All right, but for right now, the most striking aspect of Egyptian religion is belief in an afterlife. All right, this is why they like the stick figures in art. Everybody said, you know, what's that old song, Walk Like an Egyptian? People tend to make fun of Egyptian art. Egyptians knew how to paint naturalistic scenery. They didn't like that. What they like is permanence. What suggests permanence? For, well, in their minds anyway, this kind of stick arc. It was actually based off of grids so that they were really precise when they did it. I, I'm not sure why the, the, this particular text gloss, glosses over this business about the Romans had a si significant history with, with Egypt. I must not have saved my note because I, I said that's a, a huge understatement. Um, what what the, uh, the Romans, Egypt was the breadbasket of the, of the ancient world. Right? So uh, also going to be covered in the second project. Why? Why? I mean, staple annual grains were just, uh, the area was priceless for production. All right, so the Romans wanted to control it. Most people, you know, all these sort of different empires we're going to hear about running around, they all at least wanted to trade with Egypt, get those staple annual grains, especially as their populations were rising. Right? And, the, and one of the weird things to, to our way of thinking about it that we are going to revisit later is after Europe goes into the, the Middle Ages and in the, the earlier part of modernity, it, it kind of forgets. Still knows Egypt, there still knows about the pyramids and stuff like that, but you know, it's not really part of, part of their deal, their life. And then when Napoleon goes down a conquering and rediscovers this, Europe just goes crazy with, with every, especially the, 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 the Frenchies at the time, everything Egypt. I mean, it's a pretty wackadoodle stuff, especially for mummies. Uh, a little, little bit of mummy would get you way more than its weight in gold. Yeah, you know, even if somebody just thought it was money. I'm going to skip over the Old Kingdom because I'll cover that. Okay, the permanence again, right? The afterlife. They called their soul Ka. This is why they were, uh, you know, putting statues and what they were doing, the whole business about, you know, mummifying, right? Wait, why did they do this? Because they thought the Ka was going to come back. They had all those works of art, the paintings and so forth, uh, in, in the tombs for the pharaohs. They thought that the pharaohs were going to exist in those paintings and play with the objects you know, that they put down and, and, and so forth. New Kingdom. In a different version of this class a long time ago, I took a group a couple of times to uh, Hatshep's exhibition in Fort Worth. Very impressive. Uh, a lot of, uh, all I'm getting at here for right now is if you want to do a presentation on a powerful woman from way back when, there's a lot of material about Hatshepsut. She should have, you know, eventually her son should have taken, should have taken over from her, but she came up with a, a pretty, some pretty clever strategy basically to keep him from doing that. And she ruled, female pharaoh, pharaoh ruling, very rare, there's only two of them. Uh, a lot of your concern will be, or I don't know, curious I guess, uh, that this guy Ramses II, also covered in the, in the second screencast, is probably the guy who, uh, if, if there was a Moses, this was probably the guy Moses dealt with. It's from around the same time. Um, had red hair. Kind of crazy. All right. And another thing, uh, when I was talking about names a minute ago, it's just curiosity here. It, it may or it may not. It may just be a coincidence. Uh, but this got Amun. Right? He, he was the hidden one. He becomes a much uh, greater figure as, as Egypt uh, progresses. Uh, a lot of people, but not all people, think that this is where we, why we end up saying amen at the end of a prayer. It's just kind of a, a left, well, it's not really all men. The, the, the literal significance that people forgot about was that it was going back to, to this God 
And they, these were two gods, and then they kind of smashed them together and said, well, no, 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 it's really one god. We just had two names for it. So that was Ra, Amun-Ra, and then the, the, the A shifted to a, an, a you know, phonetic E over time. But this may be why we say Amen at the end of the prayer, or, or the people who say Amen may be right. Or that's where it comes from. Nobody really knows for sure. Akhenaten is how you say this. A lot of speculation about, well, this is, this is where we get the one God from. This is actually where Yahweh comes from. Right? This, when, I mean, Akhenaten's right. This is all not really provable. There's just, there's just not enough evidence on uh, either side for this, but it's always a, uh, I don't know, an item of interest for people, especially from the West that are inter interested in how did we get to a unified God? Well, this is the first example we have in history. Akhenaten uh, moved the capital, which was heinous at the time, really upset the existing Egyptian priesthood, including the very powerful priests of Amun-Ra. And after he died, they, they put his son in place, who was the boy, that's, that's, he turned into Tut, right? That's, that's who we call King Dut. Also in a previous version of this class, we went to his exhibition in Dallas, I think it was 2009. Uh, very cool, but golly, that was expensive. Okay, Tutankhamun, when a boy priest took it, yeah, so the priests were happy when they got him back in. They had an advisor to... Uh, controlling basically and then he ended up dying not necessarily he may have been murdered but it he may have just broken something and gotten infected again nobody really knows for sure and it's very difficult for the people who claim that they do know uh, to claim it off of, off of a bone scan so this is what we have prehistoric Aegean was a, a happening place uh, a story you all, you all will be interested in. The Greeks have some really crazy stories, if you're not familiar with the Greeks. Um, what happened with this, I mean, this is bestiality, right? Minos ticked off a god, he got cursed, and when you're reading ancient literature, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand what's going on because the, the, one of the curse was that his, Minos' wife was going to fall in love with the first thing that she saw when she woke up. But in the ancient world, and we're going to talk about this later, love doesn't mean love the way we use the word today. It means lust, just pure animal lust for, for somebody else. Or in this case, when she woke up for their, the, the, the family bull, as it were. Uh, very, I don't know, that story's kind of out there. And not the only one. The Greeks have a lot of out there stories. Uh, but this is where the Minotaur comes from. Kenosos, how you say this, we're going to talk, you know, uh, about why nobody really knows for sure. It seems to me like it might have been invaders, right? just pirates coming in because they didn't have, they didn't wall their cities, the Minoans. Well, you know, all named after Minos. The people at the time didn't call themselves the Minoas, Minoans. Okay, and I think without overwhelming you all right now... Mycenaean, I don't think we're going to get to for right now. So the, 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 the conquering people, we're going to deal, that's the backdrop for the Greeks. Uh, big conquering migration spread, including Greece, and where they went all the way to, the same group went all the way out to what we now call India, came, went a conquering, and by and large were successful. So changed the world over time with a, with a big migration. And, but for right now, for the business about symbolic thinking, I think you've got enough to get the response in, which I moved back to uh, Saturday night. If you already uploaded your response, usually you don't do these before the screencast is in. And if you uploaded your response and you didn't, you know, make, remember you got to make an additional 250 words, right? Do that. And you can just, anytime you upload and you realize that, wait a minute, I did the wrong thing or I didn't do enough or something like that, uh, you just upload over it. I will actually see the multiple uploads, but typically if Canvas is still working this semester the same way it has in the past, uh, then uh, y'all can just see the last one. All right, so I want to make sure everybody's in here. In the future, what we're probably going to do is go a lot slower through the actual text. I'm going to pull in some of these images. We'll talk about them. 
all that. But for right now, with some of the, the getting into Cengage problems and just sort of general clunkiness from the first week, I'm just going to have this, this shorter one and the, the longer one from before. I think that'll do us. And then by next week, I think we're going to be able to uh, rock and roll.